Ersa excellenser, travla bröder, damer och herrar, hjärtligt välkomna till operakällaren till vårt 104:e högtidsmiddag. Tiden ramlar på. 104 gånger har vi nästan inte hållit till här varje gång, men vi har varit där nu de, under en tioårsperiod de tre sista gångerna. Vi ser fram emot ett mycket spännande föredrag. Och jag lämnar ordet till vår ordförande Jonas Wallström som ska introducera vår föredragshållare. En gång hjärtligt välkomna. Tack så mycket. It's a great pleasure having you here. And I'm supposed to introduce you. And I had a quick look at your CV, which would take me about half an hour to go through. <laughs> so I, I got the excellent idea that you should present yourself in much better work than I could do. So please, the floor is yours. <laughs> My name is uh, Lars Hempelman Adams, <laughs> uh, David Hempelman Adams, and uh, thank you very much for the invite here. I'm a guest of uh, Fred and Gunn, and they've uh, been looking after me very well. And uh, thank you very much for coming long distances, especially Constance and Bry, who've come all the way from the States. Uh, just to, I don't think they're here, me, but to, uh, <laughs> to, to we had an Explorers Club uh, uh, dinner the other evening. And you'd all be very welcome to join the Explorers Club, because if you can put up with this cold weather in Stockholm, then, then, uh, you're, uh, um, then you should become members. Um, I'll tell you more about what I've uh, done when I talk about, uh, about the mercy of the winds. But uh, very quickly, uh, I've got a proper job. I run a chemical company. And while I'm not running a, a chemical company, I try and do a little bit of adventure. And uh, so I've been very lucky. I've traveled the world, traveled uh, and climbed uh, some of the mountains around the world and gone to the poles a few times. But tonight I'm going to talk about uh, a very Swedish iconic figure. And uh, I, don't, I never do talks. I have to say I never... I hate them. <laughs> and Fred, you know Fred, he uh, well, he got me here, and I'm very pleased to be here. So, so um, what I'm going to talk about very uh, quickly is a, a, a trip I did at the Mercy of the Winds, which is basically about a trip I did back in 2000, so it's a long time ago. And I haven't seen these slides for a while, so it's going to be uh, interesting. Um, so it all started off uh, back in 1998. And this is a photograph with a, a fellow friend of mine called Rune Geldness, who's a Norwegian. And uh, we're sat at the North Pole uh, waiting for a pickup. And it had taken me three attempts to try and get to the North Pole. So I was quite pleased to be at this place here. But on this particular trip um, in 98, we failed in 97. I failed back in the 80s to get to the North Pole. So this is the third time. Uh, that I tried this. But on the way there, we were pulling sledges of uh, about 150 kilos, and the temperature in the tent sometimes was uh, minus 55. <laughs> we, um, this particular day, halfway to the pole, it was a complete whiteout, and uh, we weren't very, making very much progress. And um, in, at night, I would do the navigation, so you'd have to heat up the GPS and all the batteries. And uh, I discovered after half an hour, we actually made six miles progress during the day, which for us was uh, pretty good going. And uh, in the morning, you do the same thing. You heat everything up, heat the GPS up, just to find out uh, where you were again, because it's uh, a floating ocean. And during the night, while we were asleep, uh, we drifted back seven miles. Oh. And that happened three times, uh, three days on the trot. And I thought there's got to be an easier way to get to the North Pole than this. And I thought we were going to fail again. So I was delighted that we got there. So after the trip, I got home. And I remember as a boy, 
uh, read it about the Andre expedition. And at that time, back in the 97, 96, 97, 98, I don't know if you remember, but there was a lot of trips to try and get around the world, flying around the world. There was Branson, there was uh, Steve Fossett, of course, there was the Breitling teams, Cable and Wild. So they, there was actually 22 attempts to get around the world uh, before they finally uh, f uh, succeeded. So at that time, I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic to get in a balloon uh, and get to the North Pole? So I got home, did my research, and I found no one uh, had actually tried getting to the North Pole um, and, uh, since Andre tried. And uh, a lot of you will know this is uh, the North Pole, it's an Arctic Ocean. Um, and where I went from this, this is uh, Canada, the red part. This is Alaska. This is Greenland, Iceland, Spitsbergen is there. This is where Andre uh, took off from. And this big expanse here is Russia. Um, and Andre, he uh, took off from this point um, and tried to get to the North Pole. Um, and this, just to digress, this is the point we skied from, 700 miles from the top of Warthunt Island. So uh, when um, Andre tried, the, nobody knew what actually the North Pole was. They didn't know if it was a mountain. They, they simply didn't know. They didn't know if it was an ocean. They had no idea. And this is uh, a cartoon which goes back to those times. And uh, as I said, they, they simply didn't know what was there. And there was obvious, obviously at that time, no one had been to Everest. They hadn't even measured Everest at that time. No one had been down to the South Pole, um, but um, the, the whole effort was trying to get to the North Pole. And I'm gonna pronounce these uh, names uh, wrong, and I'm, I apologize for that, Fred, but I think, <laughs> but it's uh, Andre, who you will know, and uh, very famous Swede, and he had this uh, idea of trying to fly to the North Pole. And it was a brilliant idea, actually, and uh, how he was going to do it was in a, a gas balloon. And these are uh, the three different fellas who he was going to try and fly to the North Pole uh, with. Um, and what he was using, what he tried to use, was a gas balloon. And there's three types of balloon. There's the balloon that you will see around this area, and that's normally hot air. So it works on the simple premise. If you uh, light uh, the burners, you go up, and as soon as you uh, let it cool down, it comes down. And it's quite short flights. Um, two or three hours and, and that's your maximum. Then there's a combination balloon, which is a gas uh, envelope. Normally either, uh, well it's normally uh, helium because uh, if you want to heat um, helium, it will go up and if you let it cool down, it will come down. And I'll explain a little bit more uh, in a minute. Uh, and then you've got the basic just pure gas balloon and that pure gas balloon, then you can use either hydrogen or helium. And for that, you use ballast called sand, and that uh, you go up and down. Um, and for obvious reasons, you don't want to go uh, heating up hydrogen because you're going to blow yourself up. So uh, what uh, uh, Andre was using was gas, and um, he, he actually was going to use uh, hydrogen uh, because it was much uh, cheaper and easier to get up, up to uh, Spitsbergen. Um, than using helium. And um, what you need to do when you inflate these big balloons, this big gas balloon that he's got in this hangar, um, they're very susceptible to uh, wind. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to um, inflate this thing and just have it outside because it's going to be blown away. So Andre again, he got his ship up um, and built this hangar back in uh, 1896. Uh, and he did, he was a very, very experienced gas balloonist actually. He did quite a few flights and so he was extremely experienced. So he got the uh, gas balloon made and, um, and they went up in 1896 uh, to try and fly to the North Pole. This is a hydrogen generator. What they were trying to do there is just make hydrogen. So they took sulfuric acid up and uh, metal filings and that produced the, the hydrogen. And this is the balloon. Uh, it, it was made out of Chinese silk. It, it leaked a little bit, um, and they had problems with it leaking. 
But, um, and I, this is the thing that I'm always amazed at, you Swedes are pretty tough people because it's a hydrogen balloon and all the workmen are smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Um, and this is, for me, this is a, a, an extremely poignant uh, photograph because this is, the, they've decided uh, to go uh, off on their way. And uh, they went up there in uh, 1896, as I explained, and they didn't have the right weather. They weren't very happy with the balloon and they came home. And that was the year Nansen came back or the Fram came back from the uh, Arctic Ocean and came through uh, saw the uh, hangar and all the men working there and of course the Fram uh, they, they were national heroes and poor old Andre had to come back having not actually uh, succeeded or even taken off so I think he was a little bit smarted by that and then he went back the following year um, and here he is this is the basket he's uh, standing in uh, and it's actually two stories high you can't see the bottom part of the, the basket, but they're inside the hangar, they're ready to go. And, um, and if you think of all of exploration, uh, normally you would chunk out with the knowledge. Uh, if you look at Everest, for example, uh, the Brits went out, they got out there, then the Swiss got a little bit higher, then the Brits went. So you're learning from other people's mistakes and learning from that knowledge. The same thing happened with the South Pole. And uh, whereas these guys, they were going to cut the rope, off they were going to go, and they simply didn't know where they were going to go. They took dinner suits with them just in case they met new emperors, uh, and they took uh, gifts just in case they met new kings. They simply didn't know where they were, were going. And even when you look at uh, the space race, even when they went to the other side of the moon, they had a very good idea that they were going to get back. Whereas these guys, incredibly, incredibly audacious. They were going to cut the rope and off they go. And um, for me, it was incredibly brave. And this is uh, them flying off. And uh, straight away, they had problems. They, uh, the, the ropes that they were going to use to try and steer the balloon, a couple of the uh, links went, and that uh, caused uh, problems because they were actually uh, lighter than they wanted to be, so they, they rose up and they tried to release a bit of um, uh, hydrogen and they came down. And this is quite late in the year as well. This is way up in the Jolies, and this is floating off into the sunset. Up, hopefully up onto the Arctic Ocean. And this is uh, the Eagle. Uh, after a, a, a time they were flying up uh, north. They didn't get that far north, but uh, there was that one time they were anchored and the wind was blowing them south. And Andre wouldn't uh, let go of the anchor. And if they had, they would have actually flown back, quite a long way back. But anyway, they landed and now they had to try and survive and get home. Uh, and as uh, Fred will tell you, uh, this balloon uh, is called the Eagle. And the uh, lunar module, the first lunar module actually on the moon, Apollo 11, that lunar module was called the Eagle as well. And it was named after this balloon. Uh, a lot of you will know the story. So they tried to get home. Uh, they released uh, buoys. They released uh, pigeons. Um, they were hoping they might be rescued, and they had a long fight. It was quite late in the year, so they, would have, they weren't experienced in terms of lightweight travel, uh, so they had a, a really hard time getting back. And um, these prints, of course, are from the, from the plates that they discovered when they found the bodies. And then they uh, tragically found the bodies up on White Island. All three of them had died. They sent out lots and lots of expeditions to try and find them. Um, and as you will all know, uh, they brought them back to uh, Stockholm and gave them a, a state funeral. And a lot of you will also know the other story to that was uh, uh, Anna Charlier, who was uh, engaged to Strindberg, one of the men on the expedition, she, she hung around for years, hoping that her loved one would come back because she just got engaged before he went off on this wonderful expedition. And he didn't turn back. So what did she do? She went and married an Englishman. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, off she went to England, lived in England. And uh, when she died, uh, she, she stipulated in her um, will 
Her heart should be taken out of her body and should be buried with Strindberg. And that's exactly uh, what happened. So I'm really impressed by you Swedish ladies that you, you know, really willing to do this. So I learned to fly a balloon, a hot air balloon and uh, a rosier balloon, purely and only to try and fly to the North Pole. And so I learned uh, to, I got my pilot's license, and then uh, I did something really dumb, dumber than most things I do. I went down to uh, uh, Santiago, uh, which is a beautiful city, and what I wanted to do, I don't know why I'm laughing, but what I wanted to do was try and do the first hot air balloon flight over the Andes. Oh. And um, I had my friend Runa Geldness, who was my friend from Norway. He's a, um, a marine jäger and a very good uh, at uh, parachuting. So what he was going to do, I was going to go high and he was going to actually jump onto the top of Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain <laughs> in South America. So off we go. This is the polo field in Santiago. Off we go. And um, it was pretty obvious at about 14,000 feet I got my calculations wrong because we were supposed to go up to about 25,000 feet. And I said, Runa, you're going to have to get out. And uh, so he had a cigarette while I was trying to fly. And um, he um, put his uh, parachute on and off he went off uh, out of the basket and he uh, landed in this vineyard <laughs> and he sent me a postcard he said he was happy as larry after that so <laughs> he's still down there in this vineyard <laughs> so the next thing i did was i took the balloon up to the arctic ocean because no one had actually flown for long distances or for long durations up to the arctic ocean and um, of course uh, I'm, I'm cynical enough to know when manufacturers say, oh yeah, we can do this, they actually haven't got a clue. And um, they say, oh yeah, we can go down to minus 40 and our fabric will do this. But they had no experience whatsoever. So I thought, well, um, let's go up to the Arctic. And I tried to do, well, I did a flight across uh, the Northwest Passage, trying out the radios, trying out the navigation and uh, getting up to, uh, uh, trying to get up to some altitude and see what the, what the conditions were like on a, and a completely open wicker basket. And, and this is what was really important for me. I wanted to try and get back to the Jules Verne type of travel. I didn't want a pressurized capsule with a nice uh, uh, bunk bed. I just wanted to get back to Andre, how he did it in a complete wicker basket. Uh, and this is flying across uh, Resolute Bay, and it was obviously the first time they'd ever seen a, a balloon. And so the Inuits there were shooting at me. <laughs> and um, it was pretty scary for a while. And uh, they finally came out and picked us up out onto, this is the other side of the Northwest Passage. But we learnt a lot. It was, a, it, it was very <laughs> interesting. Now, of course, uh, Andre, he didn't have any... Uh, GPS's, he didn't have any Iridium phones, and he, the important thing is he didn't have any meteorological data. All he had was a couple flags on the top of uh, the hangar that they had the balloon in, and they were just waiting for the uh, wind to change direction and take them north, which was hopeless. And today we, we can uh, well, looking at the weather, we can be quite accurate. Now, the problem is, is the, the systems around the lower part of the world, they're pretty accurate. But of course, up on the North Pole or the Arctic Ocean, there's no uh, big weather stations. They don't get much data because there's not much uh, flying across the Arctic Ocean. Um, and when I first talked to three or four different meteorologists, they all said it was impossible to do. They said there's no way because of a high pressure zone, you're not going to get the distance, so don't even try it. And, um, and this is uh, the North Pole again. This is uh, Greenland. This is Spitsbergen. Uh, this, is, this is Oslo. This is Stockholm, you can see here. This is Great Britain. And so just to very quickly give you, um, these are the different heights. So what, what you get is if you fly at different heights, you can sometimes get different directions. So on this particular day, if I'd actually taken off on the 26th of May, 
at uh, 1800 hours. If I'd taken off from Spitsbergen, which is where I wanted to, to start off from to try and get to the North Pole, actually I would have come right down across Iceland, all the way across uh, Ireland, and I would have landed in my backyard. <laughs> so that wasn't really what I wanted to do. And as I said, uh, all the meteorologists said it was impossible, um, except for one man called Luke Trulemans, who's the uh, Belgium uh, uh, meteorologist, and a brilliant meteorologist, actually. And really, what I have to try and get across to you is the pilot, the pilot is just the monkey in the basket. All the pilot's doing is just eating a few ginger biscuits and a cup of tea and just telling him where you are. It's the meteorologist with the skill because he's looking at two or three days weather. It's just like a uh, 3D chess game in the atmosphere. So he's looking at the different lows around the Arctic Ocean and trying to see where you can get this balloon to pick up another low or another high. So he would say, right, I want you to take off and I want you to go to 8,000 feet. I want you to find a track, a 240, and I want, I want you to stay there for six hours. And then he would say, right, once you've done your six hours, then I want to find you to find two, uh, 200 as a heading. And he, he will say, and I think you'll find it at roughly about 8,000 feet. So he's thinking, days and days and days ahead. So that's what you're trying to get to. And as you can see, again, from this, if I'd taken off on the 25th of May from Spitsbergen, I wouldn't have gone straight to the North Pole, but at this particular height, which is 6,000 meters, I would have come down south, gone across into the Russian airspace, come up over Franz Josef Land, and can you see these three different tracks now? They've di diverted because those are different heights. So the track here, around here, that's at 8,000 meters. And this particular one uh, in pink is 6,000 meters. So uh, Luke thought, well, maybe we can um, do it. But he only found in the entire uh, time he was looking at it for that whole spring, he, uh, he only found three uh, tracks and the closest he could get to the North Pole was uh, about um, 60 miles. So we said as a team, we said well let's give it a go um, because 60 miles Andre would have known uh, if there was a mountain or if it was an ocean uh, so let's give it a go. So we had this uh, control room in Bristol in England uh, this, the, the little guy in the middle is called Brian Jones. He's actually the fellow who flew around the world. So he, uh, he gave us some fantastic advice and uh, Luke Trillum as well. So we shipped everything up to Spitsbergen, Longyearbyen, and we realized that first we were, I was, you know, camping in my office in um, England and we realized it wasn't going to work that way. So we had to bring everybody up uh, and stay in Spitsbergen. And our uh, cutoff point was going to be the 1st of May because on the 1st of May, if I needed a rescue from a twin otter, uh, the surface would have been too soft for them to land. So 1st of May was going to be the cutoff point. Um, so we were up in Spitsbergen. It just, um, we went up there about January and um, couldn't drink any alcohol, of course, because you might have been flying the following day. So it was a tough time up there uh, without any alcohol. And what I found in Spitsbergen, in Longyearbyen, you have these uh, glaciers up here. And every single day, you would get these catabatic winds coming off these mountains. And we weren't quite sure how this was going to work out once you tried to inflate this balloon. So we uh, hung around and we hung around and it was a real groundhog day. Every single day you would check with Luke and he'd say nothing's happening, nothing's happening, there's no chance for another week and it was getting uh, pretty depressing. This is all the gear uh, that we've flown up and uh, this is, this is uh, the storage area uh, which we used which was the old fire station up in uh, Spitsbergen. 
And uh, this is where I used to sleep every night in the basket, because I was trying to get used to sleeping in a little confined space. Um, and um, I'm cheap as well. It was cheaper than using a hotel. <laughs> um, and so the 1st of May came and went, and I thought, goodness, you know, what do we do now? So then I had this idea, because you know, I'd been to the North Pole and I, had, I could ski, um, if, we, if I had to land, then I'll try and ski out so uh, we could get a nice breaker or within range of a, a helicopter. So uh, we changed the plans again and uh, we said, right, 1st of June, we've got to cancel. There's no way after 1st of June. So again, every day, and it was just hard because everyone was waiting. And of course, at the top of this chimney, uh, I was looking at the top of the chimney, just exactly the same as Andre, and the uh, smoke from the chimney stack was going north. And I phoned up Luke on the sat phone, and I said, Luke, it's going north. He said, yes, for about five miles, and then that's it. <laughs> so unfortunately, it didn't do it. And then we got the call from Luke. He said, I think in three days there's, there might be an opportunity. And so it was quite exciting. Uh, to get everybody together and try it. And this is the Last Supper. This is the night before uh, we were going to go, or I was going to go. And um, so everyone was ready. And unfortunately, when we got uh, in the morning, the winds were coming down so strongly that there was no way we could have inflated this balloon. Um, but I said, look, what we've got to try and do is get all the gear out because it would be a good test anyway if uh, we got to uh, pack it all up and come back the following year. At least we can see we got all our logistics right. And that's exactly what we did. We got all the um, gear up onto, this is just outside a little school, little playground in um, Longbian. Getting the basket, getting the uh, helium up onto the field. And the people from uh, Longbian were m absolutely magnificent in the way they helped. And this is the envelope, which is what we call the um, balloon. It's just called an envelope. So we laid that out, getting everything ready. And um, Luke was saying, you've got to take off at 3 o'clock or we're going to lose the slot. And of course, this was 8 o'clock in the morning. And these balloons with these catabatic winds were just just horizontal and so we weren't quite sure and we were going to call it off scrub the uh, flight and then all of a sudden the wind stopped and the blooms were vertical and I thought oh my goodness I'm going to have to do this now and uh, so this is the school getting everything ready getting all the uh, helium into the envelope and um, getting the immersion suit on checking all the, the gear. And this is just, a, just like a, an airplane. You're checking your navigation, your radio, your, your comms, the, the GPSs, uh, your tracking, the whole lot. So this is, um, this is the team asking for a pay rise. <laughs> checking all the gear again. And, uh, and then the saleswoman came up and he said, uh, oh, I wish you luck. And um, he said, what flags have you got there? And I said, well, of course, the English flag and, uh, and the Swedish flag. And he said, oh, and where's the Norwegian flag? And I said, well, it's above the, all of them. So he said, oh, that's all right then. <laughs> and here we are. Now, now this is quite safe now. Now it doesn't matter if we get any strong winds. The, the balloon's completely inflated and ready to go. And so that was it. We uh, had very good communications back to Bristol. We had a, a good track. Luke had said, right, I want you straight up to 8,000 feet. I want you to find, try and find this uh, particular heading. And um, it was, it was strange because no one had ever done this before. People had gone across the Atlantic and they crossed, uh, done lots of other things, but no one had ever done this. And Gavin, um, he looked at my watch, I had a very nice watch. And he said, look, if anything happens, can I have your watch, please? <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. So off I go. 
And my knees were trembling for <laughs> six hours, I think. So off I went. And the first thing I found was none of the communications worked. The VHF wasn't working. The HF wasn't working. Well, I was off going off to 8,000 feet. Uh, the iridium wasn't working. The Imarsat wasn't working. Nothing was working. And I couldn't quite understand why. So we, you, know, you go through like anything else. You have these books and you're reading, making sure everything's ready and uh, switching on and off, changes the fuses, and nothing worked. And um, you need communications. Went straight over the airport and uh, couldn't communicate with them. And uh, we had a helicopter doing a bit of filming. I couldn't even communicate with the helicopter either. So that was uh, nearly six hours, no communication. So then I thought, well, there's no way can you try and get up onto the Arctic Ocean with no... Uh, meteorological data and any tracking systems. So I started to stow everything away with the view of trying to land because I didn't want to go up on the Arctic Ocean without any comms. So uh, even that I couldn't communicate uh, with anybody. This is looking through uh, at the balloon from the helicopter. So off I was going and uh, started to pack everything away to come down to actually land. And you see the polar bears down below licking their chops at this Englishman. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, you know, this is heavy. This is a heavy uh, balloon with a lot of gas, uh, probably a couple of tons of gas. And so I was slightly worried if I hit one of these mountains pretty hard that I could be toast. So, um, and then eventually, just coming down nearly about 2,000 feet, I started to get comms uh, through Iceland radio on the HF, which was staggering. And amazingly, um, I managed to pick up a British Airways flight going across the North Atlantic, and they did a relay from me into Bristol. And um, they said, um, what are you eating up there? And I said, oh, ginger biscuits and a cup of tea. I said, what are you eating down there? They go, lobster. <laughs> So eventually, we uh, managed to get the comms up, I managed to get hold of Luke, and uh, I had to get straight back up to 8,000 feet. And to this day, we, do, we don't know why we lost the comms. They think they, they pumped the helium in so fast um, that um, there was problems. They, they, they don't know, but that was the, maybe the problem. So off I went straight back up to 8,000 feet, and um, going all the way up over the mountains, out onto the pack ice. And of course, what happens is that whilst you've got 24 hours of sunshine, you still get this diurnal effect. Because what happens is, uh, even though it's all minus 20, um, the sun goes down. And that actually, with the helium inside the, the balloon, that would affect the um, flow and the flight profile of the balloon. So to keep a level flight, if Luke says, I want you to keep at 8,000 feet, and you've got that diurnal effect, what you have to do is during the, the night time, um, when the sun comes down, you lose temperature. The balloon will start to go down. So what you need to do then is heat the helium up so it actually floats back up to the height that you want. Um, and then what happens is you, you have level flight during the night because this burner will be on an autopilot, so it will keep it pretty level. And then, of course, when the sun does come up, even though it's sort of minus 20s, uh, the sun will come up and you will get a different temperature then, uh, and the bloom will start to rise. Uh, and if you want it to 8,000 feet, then you've got to release. So there's a big valve at the top. You release a little bit of helium and that will bring you back to level flight again. So it's uh, slightly complicated, but uh, basically, if you want to come down, you let a little bit of helium out. If you want to go up, then you heat the helium up with the burners. So you keep at that level flight. And this is uh, going out across. Um, it took actually uh, four days to get up to the North Pole. Went flying up over Russia, this is a bit of a con. I only slept uh, a few hours uh, in six days. I, th I think I slept, uh, I think it was 18 hours in the whole six days. This photograph was taken from inside that fire station. One of the guys took it when I was sleeping in the basket. 
this is the autopilot, uh, and this is the complete mess inside my basket. These are the little, very little burners. Uh, so these are the little burners that heat up that um, helium. Going up, as I said, way up over the Russian airspace, um, way, way, way up, and uh, very beautiful, it's really stunningly beautiful. And um, lots of open water uh, all around. It was quite scary to see so much open water going up. And um, very little cloud layer as well. I was above the cloud, so it was beautiful blue skies all the way up to the, the North Pole. And what happened was um, I went up over Russian airspace, and we were trying to get within one degree of the pole. We thought that was our target area. If we could get one degree, because it was over a thousand miles, the track that we'd taken. And I keep saying we because it's the team effort. Um, and it was amazing. I was off on the way to uh, Alaska, and I was 120 miles off the pole. And without me doing anything, uh, the balloon just did a right angle. And the balloon started to fly in towards the North Pole. And uh, we went down from 120 miles, 110, 100, and kept going, 90, 80, 70. And then we got into that one degree, which was you know, really fantastic. Uh, and that's like going from Stockholm back to London in a balloon and being within 60 miles. And then it kept going. And um, the balloon flew on, and without me touching anything, and it actually stopped at eight miles from the pole without me doing anything at all. And I'm convinced Andre was helping me. <laughs> I really do believe Andre was over my shoulder giving this a go. So anyway, I contacted uh, Luke and the control room and I said, what do I do now? And they said, we don't know. Uh, we're getting drunk, we're celebrating. So well, I was sat there, uh, I hadn't landed, I was about 4,000 feet. So they were looking at all the weather. And then they said, Luke came back on, he said, <coughs> I want you to come down to 2,000 feet and I'll give you a fast jet stream all the way back to Spitsbergen. <coughs> Which was a problem because all the team, I had two guys had gone into Canada, two guys had gone into Russia, two guys to go into Alaska, a couple of guys to go into Greenland, but no one was back in Spitsbergen. <laughs> so this is uh, what happened. This is uh, Spitsbergen here. We've got Greenland over here, uh, Franz Joseph land. So what happened, I came up, came across, and I was flying that way towards Alaska, and what happened, got to there, and then the balloon came into the North Pole, and that took four days to get up there, and then it just took two days, really low level, fast jet, low level jet, came straight back to Spitsbergen, and I got picked up just there. So this is me eating my ginger biscuits, and, um, and then it was a very quick flight all the way back. And of course, that was slightly worrying at a low level height because, uh, and I was really, really tired. But if you, if you mess up, you know, you haven't got that much altitude to sort it out. So I was catnapping for sort of half an hour at a time. Um, but it, it does catch up with you. And then flying back to uh, Spitsbergen, um, I could see all this uh, open water. And it was uh, slightly, slightly worrying. And then just on the north of Spitsbergen, I again talked to uh, the control room, and they said, look, uh, we get the helicopter up to give you a hand, <coughs> and you can land anywhere you like. And I said, but there's a, there's a lot of open water in front of me. And they said, no, 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 there's no open water. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure that's water. No, 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 you can put it down anywhere you like. I said, look, please just humor me, just have a look at the uh, thermographs. And they came back, they go, ooh, you're right, there's a lot of water down there. 
So I slowly, slowly came down and um, I had to come down through the cloud and they promised me there was pack ice the other side of this water. And um, even though I had my merchant suit on, uh, I wasn't very keen on coming down and trying to bail out waiting for a helicopter. <coughs> and so slowly, slowly coming down, uh, coming down through the clouds and having to try and land this uh, thing. And this is the last uh, slide of the night. But um, what happened was I landed in the water and I was doing about 12 knots. And I was trying to release the helium out of the top because, um, you know, I had to stop. So I was coming out of the water onto the ice, into the water and onto the ice. And I, I actually went nearly uh, five miles trying to do this. And um, so I was just hoping that once the uh, envelope did stop, that I didn't actually stop in the water. And thankfully, I landed on, on the ice. And the uh, helicopter landed, they got me in, and uh, off I went back to Spitsbergen um, to have a, a nice uh, sleep and a nice beer. And um, the thing is with this trip, of all the things I've ever done, uh, Everest or the North Pole or the South Pole, Really, I've, I've, owned, I've always followed in someone else's footsteps. I've followed either Hillary or Peary or Admondson. Uh, this is the first time, actually, I tried something, uh, and, and I, was, I was very proud of the team that we, although everybody said it was impossible, that we actually gave it a go. And uh, then I, I uh, was invited back to Grana, which is where the Andre Museum was. And they were very, very generous, and they were very, very kind, saying what a you know, great trip. Uh, but for me, um, for me, what it demonstrated, actually, was how brilliant Andre was. Andre, actually, was 100 years ahead of his time. And we proved, actually, it was possible. He was simply in the, the wrong era at that time to try this. And what he did was uh, truly magnificent. And the only reason we were successful because we were following in uh, Andre and his team's footsteps. Thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Thank you.